Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's event, The F Word, Fascist Drift in America. We're being hosted by the Democracy Initiatives Memory Project at the University of Virginia in partnership with the Miller Center. The Democracy Initiative integrates research, teaching, and public engagement on democracy at a global scale. Visit democracyinitiative.virginia.edu. The DI brings together a diverse range of scholars, government leaders, and practitioners to study and advance the prospects of democracy around the world. It's a testament to the fine staff uh, at the Democracy Initiative and the Miller Center that this webinar was convened so quickly and able to accommodate so many uh, attendees only one week after the momentous insurrection at the Capitol <clears throat> building. And as our capacity allows, we hope to have more such discussions in response to evolving events. I'm Jelaine Schmidt, today's moderator. I am the director of the University of Virginia Democracy Initiative's Memory Project, and I'm an associate professor of religious studies. My teaching and research centers on the topics of race, religion, and social movements. And I am also a scholar activist in the community of Charlottesville, Virginia, which in August, 2017 was until last Wednesday, the site of the largest far right rally in decades. The panels for our conversation have each conducted extensive research for years on the US far right and generously share their knowledge with their combined 180,000 Twitter followers uh, as well as through other uh, venues. You can go to this panel's event description on the UVA Miller Center's website for everyone's Twitter handle. All of the panelists were present at rallies in the streets of Charlottesville in 2017 during what locals here call the Summer of Hate. In just the past week, our panelists have been featured in various media outlets. They will speak to us about last week's Capitol building insurrection and far right organizing more generally from their respective vantage points as a data scientist, a historian, and a journalist. Emily Grisinski is head of data for ThoughtWorks Germany. Uh, she's a racial justice activist from Charlottesville, Virginia. She participated in counter demonstrations there against far right rallies during the summer of 2017. Subsequently, uh, Gorsensky created First Vigil, a database of criminal cases involving hate crimes. And her counter extremism research was featured in various journalistic outlets and, and documentary films, including uh, uh, the PBS ProPublica Emmy Award winning uh, documentary Documenting Hate, Charlottesville. This week, she was featured in The Guardian and The Washington Post. Nicole Hemmer is an associate research scholar at Columbia University, where she works on the Obama presidency oral history project. She is the co-founder of Made by History, the political history section of the Washington Post. Formerly, Dr. Hemmer was at the UVA Miller Center, the host for today's webinar, where she produced the award-winning award -winning podcast A12, The Story of Charlottesville. Hemmer is the author of Messengers of the Right, A History of American Conservative Media, Check out her op-ed this week at CNN.com, The Striking Parallels Between the Assaults on Charlottesville and the Capitol. Christopher Mathias is senior reporter at the HuffPost, where he covers the far right, disinformation, and hate. Mathias has reported from the ground, on the ground on a pivotal demonstrations around the U.S., including the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, militia gatherings and Trump rallies, Black Lives Matter protests, uh, and the, after, the aftermath of mass shooting, as, as well as the trials of various far-right figures. Check out his HuffPost article from yesterday titled, Charlottesville Tried to Warn You This Would Happen. Um, so that seems like actually a good place to begin our conversation, I think, you know, since, uh, um, you know, and just to, you know, per, for posterity, since this is being recorded, uh, uh, what we are responding to is that last week, January the 6th, 2021, uh, supporters of President Trump, at his urging, attacked the United States Capitol building in an attempt to prevent the United States Congress from certifying the votes for his democratically elected successor, Joe Biden. So if I can pose to each of you, since you've been answering this question now for the past week for, you know, for a lot of different outlets, if you can talk to us, talk to our audience about um, the, the links, the parallels, indeed the sometimes actual overlap in personnel and organizations between Charlottesville's Unite the Right rally and this recent 
attack on the U.S. Capitol? What, what lessons should have been learned and what informs your analysis on this? Emily, I'm going to call on you first. Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start here. So there's two things that stick out to me when looking at the parallels between what happened in Charlottesville and what happened in Washington uh, last week. The yeah. first of those is the way that uh, authorities and law enforcement ignored very clear and explicit threats of violence from the, the attendees and from the planners. There was no subtlety in the messaging, in the, the advertising of the rally. It was explicitly uh, at, described as something that would be violent. The second thing that sticks out is that Charlottesville and, and uh, what happened in Charlottesville and what happened in Washington are not the only two such events. Uh, a lot of people like to say that there's a straight line between Charlottesville and DC. <clears throat> That's true, but there were a number of other smaller events that happened um, both before Unite the Right and in between these two events, such as the, uh, the gun rally in Richmond, Virginia uh, last January, the rallies at the state houses um, this past spring, um, <clears throat> along with other fascist rallies uh, throughout the country. So those are the two things that really, to me, stick out when looking at these events. Okay, police not taking the, or not taking the warning seriously, even though they're announced ahead of them. Yeah, other, um, others, um, Christopher, yeah, you wanna, I, or yeah, go ahead. Nikki, oh. yeah, go ahead. I, I would just underscore what Emily has said. I mean, over the course of the past three to four years, the DH, Department of Homeland Security, even under Trump, has underscored that right-wing terrorists are the most persistent and lethal threat to the U.S., and yet this reluctance to take them seriously, even when they're at the doors of the Capitol, I think is an important um, thing to underscore. And I would say that one of the things that I was struck by is a, a key difference between the two. And that is that even though the violence in Charlottesville and the violence at the Capitol were fundamentally anti-democratic, they were attacks on democracy, it really was only with the attack on the Capitol that I think most Americans understood that. Because the Capitol is such a visible and shared symbol of American democracy, even with all of the American flags draped on the people who were attacking it, even with the chance of USA, USA, I think that we, we got, Americans got that this was an attack on democracy itself. And I don't know if that will ultimately make the response more powerful, but it's something that is a pretty marked difference. And I, I, would, I would just add that um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of parallels with the aftermath of what happened. So right now, for example, we're kind of seeing this, and I, and I mean this in a positive way, like a, a mass doxing and deplatforming of um, the people that were involved. Um, and that obviously was something that, that occurred after Charlottesville. And a lot of the people that attended that rally, um, you know, were tarnished, have been tarnished with that rightfully since they, since they attended that rally. Um, and I think we're gonna see that going forward with the Capitol as well. Um, I also think we're seeing a sudden reckoning by uh, big tech of their complicity mm -hmm. in, in letting the, the far right uh, organize so clearly online. Um, that, that also happened after Charlottesville, but they you know, still haven't taken it as seriously as they needed to over the last four years. And I feel like a lot of people in our world have been screaming at them about this. Um, and now it's only after a highly visible event where they are so clearly implicated and they know it's bad PR that they have to uh, step up and act. Um, so I think this is yet another parallel. Yeah, right. Yeah. If I might jump in uh, Go ahead, for a moment please. there. Um, because, you know, as a data scientist, I work in the, in the tech industry and um, mm -hmm. I'm very uh, familiar with uh, many of the, the people who are um, making the decisions at these companies, um, in, in many cases, I know them firsthand or, or we've worked together. Um, and in other cases, you know, we, we go to the same conferences all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that there's a, one of the differences between what happened in, in Charlottesville and what is happening now is that we're seeing an upswell in labor organizing um, mm -hmm. that is leading to this deplatforming. So there was a lot of outrage um, and encouragement to throw off some of these fascist groups, you know, for Twitter to ban um, some of the, the 
the organizations that were present at Unite the Right, um, you know, pressure to ban Donald Trump and some other media figures. And, and some of it was successful in 2017. But what we're seeing now that's different is um, reports that groups, large groups of employees at Twitter and at Amazon at, and at some of these other companies are really starting to speak up and they're, they're putting their voices together and saying, look, we can't continue to be complicit with this. We can't continue to, to build and maintain your product. And I think that's an important part of uh, this dynamic is that we have to understand that there's people who build these things. Mm -hmm. There's an ethics to what we're building as technologists. And um, we have to sort of, it, as Christopher said, you know, big tech is complicit. Well, that means that we are, as technologists can also be complicit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add to what Christopher said that he's also giving us a bit of a warning because in the aftermath of Charlottesville, we saw um, we saw deplatforming, we saw some of the organizations that were involved, the white power organizations collapse, and yet it still served as a recruiting event. It still served as a signal moment in the development of white power in the United States, so much so that we were, you were able to see something like what happened at the Capitol. So that, that momentary reaction is very powerful and it can be very meaningful, but it has to be continued. That same pressure has to be applied going forward or we could just as likely see um, that, I mean, the Capitol attack is going to be a recruiting event. So what are you going to do going forward to help to continue to disrupt those networks? Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more because I, I actually think it's that's kind of the scariest part right now is that like thinking about this as a mass recruiting event because you know in a lot of ways the far right is going to see this as a success they they breached the seat of American power um, and I think you know one of the big differences and one of the scary developments um, is that you know whereas Charlottesville was kind of uh, died in the wool explicit fascist and white supremacist um, the gathering we saw. At, um, at, the, at the Capitol, you know, was, you know, a mixture of less explicit, but still, still explicit, but less explicit. Um, and, you know, people that, you know, would, no would normally just be called Trump supporters. Um, and I think it's important that we start thinking of the MAGA movement as a, you know, extremist or fascist one. Yeah. And I think a, a really important part of that is remember that um, as perhaps laughable as it was, the people who organized the rally in Charlottesville organized the Unite the Right rally. And it didn't seem that they were very successful in uniting the right. But under the MAGA banner, you really have seen mm -hmm. a kind of unity be forged with these very extreme violent neo-Nazi groups all the way through people who tend to think of themselves simply as devoted Trump supporters. The QAnon conspiracy has been folded in there even more so than it was in 2017. So I think that there is, um, again, warning flares on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, you know, Nikki, that uh, the, you know, the, the coalescing that can occur under, uh, you know, the banner, the MAGA, MAGA banner, you know, and especially with a kind of, uh, you know, I guess to some, you know, charismatic leader, you know, a kind of, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of this cult of personality, you know, that, that's going on, that that is, uh, you know, more able to coalesce uh, these otherwise very disparate groups, you know, uh, uh, you know, into into a kind of a, something of a movement, you know? Um, would, would any of you, you know, kind of I, uh, want to talk about some of the actors behind this, you know, uh, where are they from? How are they coordinating? Uh, you know, what, what are, you know, how are their means of, of, of uh, organizing and how are their organizations evolving? What, who are these people? I think there's, it's a really interesting mix of people. So if you look at any of the footage, you get this really eclectic um, group of, of folks that are storming the Capitol. You've got like that, you know, the Q Anon or the Q Shaman guy that's got the horns on his head and he, and he looks ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the point is to make it look ridiculous. Uh, and then you've got these militia guys that are, they look like they're, you know, fresh off out of the 10th mountain division um, you know, with their tactical gear and all of that, and then everything, everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, what's striking to me is that when you break it down and you try to identify who's who, mm -hmm. you get a, 
there's a, a dissonance between what the common perception of the far right is mm -hmm. and Trump supporters are and mm -hmm. who they really are. So a lot of these folks are extremely wealthy or at least yeah. firmly middle class. Right. They're, they're coming from you know, the suburbs, you know, nice houses, they're driving nice cars. Some of them are flying in on private jets. Um, one of the guys that was dressed up in, in furs, he, he was just arrested. He was the son of a judge in New York, right? So these are not people that are your, um, your disenfranchised, uh, you know, rural, mm. lower income, you know, white voter. These are well-to-do people. Mm. That's a little bit different than what happened in Charlottesville where you had a, a much younger movement mm. um, in the streets. A lot of those guys were in their early 20s. Some of them came from privilege, some of them didn't, but they weren't really at that point of being off on their own yet. Um, and so that, that is one, I think, one difference there. Um, and then we have to address this, this sort of class dynamic in, in the yeah. MAGA crowd. Yeah, and I think like, you know, the, the right and the MAGA crowd really likes to depict itself as kind of the, the, the movement of blue collar workers and stuff. But, you know, repeatedly, like I, those images this week of the MAGA people on the private plane flying to DC um, were a good example of that. Um, and then, you know, I would just add that um, as far as kind of the people we are seeing in the Capitol, um, you know, I've spent the last couple of years going to a lot of Trump rallies and it's kind of the same coalition of people you see at all these events, um, which is, um, you know, as far as formal groups are concerned, um, Proud Boys, Militia, uh, QAnon. Um, and, you know, these people have been welcomed into the MAGA fold for years. Um, and the Trump administration, the Trump campaign has more than condoned them. Um, and I think, you know, one of, um, you know, we were talking about them kind of coalescing under this MAGA umbrella. Um, I actually think the Proud Boys are a very instructive example of the direction that like American fascism is going in. Um, because I think, you know, I think Nikki, you, you were talking about kind of like this rebranding um, and the Proud Boys have found some success there. Um, you know, most not notably, I think by kind of confusing our traditional, traditional ideas of a hate group. Um, for example, by allowing members of color, um, even though they were founded by white supremacists and founded on white nationalist ideals, they realized that they couldn't make that much hedge with, like headway in society if they remained that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it's important to understand that they still allow white nationalists in their group. And that also they are decidedly misogynistic and anti-feminist and anti-left and anti-Muslim and anti-trans and, and all these types of things. And, you know, our literal, black shirts, they are black shirts. The, the, the whole purpose of their movement is to uh, violently confront people on the street. Yeah, and there's a, a sorry, there's a question in, in, uh, that's been posed about um, one of the Proud Boys that was arrested who's, who's married to a black woman. And this is a common thing in the Proud Boys. They, um, as Christopher said, it, they're a group that has these ideals of, of white nationalism, but they, have gained this mainstream acceptance in the wake of the sort of 2017, 2018 collapse of the alt-right. Um, and they're using this sort of uh, this perception bias about who white nationalists are to gain this sort of mainstream acceptance. Um, and this is, it gets into really complex racial dynamics to understand, you know, how can a proud boy be black and be fighting for white supremacy? Or how can a proud boy be white and married to a black woman, but still be fighting for white supremacy? And, and they depend on that to shift this image away from um, the sort of skinhead neo-Nazi, you know, swastika waving mm -hmm. um, uh, optics that the media is, it, it's very easy to say, to point at a swastika and say, oh, that's bad, or a clan mm -hmm. hood and say, oh, that's bad. It's much more difficult. You have to get into much more theory and, and uh, complexity to explain why this, you know, Samoan dude is is a white supremacist when he's beating up, you know, a, a white anti-fascist. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, a, a deliberate tactic on their part. Okay. Yeah. And Emily and Christopher are pointing to a, a 
major problem with reporting on both Trump supporters and on the far right more broadly. And that is that journalists and consumers of media tend to bring with them uh, a wrong idea of what racism looks like, who racists look like, who the far right looks like. Um, but it has been the case throughout American history that people who espouse white nationalist ideas are people across the um, class spectrum. Um, the people who uh, were under those Ku Klux Klan hoods were just as much community leaders as they were the poor people in town um, and in groups like um, the White Citizens Council, right? Those were the business elites of the towns that they lived in. And even today, you know, there was a real marvel at somebody like Richard Spencer because he ate fancy sushi and because he wore mm -hmm. bad suits, but the fact that he wore a suit at all was supposed to make him dapper. And that idea that white supremacists and white nationalists and people on the far right only look one way and only fit one sort of like slack jawed yokel profile, that has been an endemic problem with the reporting on these movements um, and also people's expectations about these movements. And the more that we can help shed light on um, who these people are and overturning some of those assumptions, I think um, we'll get a lot further. Yeah, I mean, it's it's worth uh, recalling that, I mean, historically, the, the Klan was founded by elites. It was founded by Confederate officers, you know, directly after the war. And then the second Klan uh, was that was just kind of Main Street USA. It was businessmen, you know, very respectable, like, you know, joining the Masons or the Elks or whatever, you know, and it's, it's I mean, it's only been in more recent decades that the Klan, and here I'm speaking formally of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, uh, has been, you know, kind of this stereotypical image, which, which predominates, but historically speaking, that is not accurate, you know, and arguably, I mean, uh, the most damaging white supremacists are those that wear coat and ties. I mean, you know, they're actually able to, uh, you know, promote uh, uh, this agenda. I want to um, pull up an image here, and it's the image that we had for our, to promote this event, if we can get that pulled up to show, um, here and just kind of discuss this because uh, uh, you know both uh, Nikki and and uh, uh, Emily both brought up that you know that that uh, I, mean, I heard you say this I think uh, uh, Emily that you know kind of fascism that it looks different that you know you look at a at a swastika and you know everyone knows that person's a fascist you know but uh, I want us to kind of unpack this image and I, I should say just to explain to the audience. This is a rally which took place about 11 months ago. Uh, this is a group called Patriot Front. They are marching over the bridge from Arlington, Virginia into DC and they are marching on the Capitol. That was their uh, destination. And in, in doing so, they, they took over the streets here. Uh, they wore masks over their face, which were, that was illegal in, in, in Virginia, but, but uh, they were kind of left alone. I just want to like kind of unpack the symbolism here of, of what's going on. You know, if, I mean, most people would see this, I think, and it's, you know, like you said, if you see a swastika, you know, those folks are fascists. What's, I mean, these, these, uh, this Patriot Front group here is, it, they are self-identified um, fascists, you know, so what is it about this image that we need to unpack for people to explain what fascism looks like today? Um, who, wants to, who wants to take it? Um, I, can, I, mean, I can start. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the challenges with talking about fascism in a U.S. context is that there is an assumption that fascism is a foreign import to the U.S. and so that it is signified by foreign symbols. It's one of the reasons why the Nazi flag gets so much attention during the violence in Charlottesville. Um, but of course, fascism is a nationalist movement. It's about violent patriotic pride. And so we should expect that U.S. fascism, as they say, comes wrapped in the flag because that's what it looks like. And so we have, I, th I think there's a tendency to be confused about the iconography because you don't expect the American flag to be um, the flag of fascism. For most Americans, that seems pretty jarring. Um, but we have to understand fascism as a nationalist movement that is really soaked in nationalist symbols like that flag. Yeah, sorry, we're trying to pull that back up here, that, that image, so we can look at it just, just a bit longer. Um, yeah, others of you, what what's your thinking? Um, I mean, I guess we could talk about the uniformity um, of everything they're wearing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of this uh, militaristic discipline. Um, 
and fetish, fetishization of that kind of stuff. Um, also, I mean, the very concept of Reclaim America is a very fascist one, right? Because in fascist movements, you, you know, have, you create this kind of mythic past um, where of like religious or racial or cultural purity um, that we need to get back to. And in order to do that, we need to, you know, expel certain other groups from society. Um, so I think that kind of idea of reclaim America or make America great again is a very, very fascist one. And I think that, you know, when we look at this image, there's a lot of branding that's happening here and they're really playing to your biases. So there's a couple things that I wanna point out. The first is um, that, that flag, if you look at this, if you're driving down the street, you see this, you see, oh, there's a bunch of Americans, They're, they love the flag. That is not an American flag. If you look at the field on that flag, that is not 50 stars. That is a fascist logo. If you look at their masks where they have the arrows, this looks like the, the, the arrows and, and the olive branch that we have in a lot of American iconography, but it's not. And then, in fact, if you, if you go through American iconography, if you look at, for example, the Lincoln Monument, the, the chair upon which Lincoln sits is uh, engraved with two fasces, the, the bundle of sticks around an ax. That is a, a fundamental symbol of, of fascism. Currently, this symbol was an, is an ancient Roman symbol um, and it, it predates the modern fascist movement. Um, but this, the, the Patriot Front, the group that they, they sprung out of, they were formed in the wake of Unite the Right, used that, that fascist as its primary, primary symbol. So this is something that is designed to play on the biases that you encounter in American culture in everyday life, the, the singing the anthem at football game, seeing the flag raised, right? All of this um, Americana. And they're basically saying, look, we're, we're just, you know, we're like you, we're the good old American boys. Yeah, it was, right. It's it's been interesting during the Capitol riots. Um, I know it's getting some attention now, and, and this is the same for MAGA rallies throughout the years, but it's very common to see America first flags at, at those rallies, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, like, you know, the, the Groyper, like, white nationalist movement founded by Nick Fuentes that, like, who was in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's, the flag looks like it's, you know, has kind of American colors and has America on it, you know, it, it kind of passes, like pe people don't initially see it for what it is. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, um, uh, you know, what, what Emily said about, you know, the, the fasces is, I mean, this is an ancient Roman symbol of, of authority and specifically, you know, judges, you know, carried this and this sort of thing, which was repurposed, of course, by Mussolini in the 20th century, you know, to represent his black shirt movement, you know, uh, uh, you know the fascists, you know, um, from which we get the name, you know, right. Um, so, yeah, so there's a whole lot of kind of, you know, repurposing, uh, you know, going on definitely. Um, yeah, and the kind of, you know, the good old red, white, and blue. I mean, hey, what's what's the problem here? I mean, a lot of people, I mean, of course, around the world, the United States flag, uh, you know, has, has uh, symbolized domination for many other kind of subjects, colonized people too. So we can't, we shouldn't forget that, you know, as well. But in terms of kind of a U, general U.S. audience, this, you know, may not be able to, you know, to kind of pick up on this as, you know, as, as quickly here, you know? Um, yeah, so, uh, so this, this um, kind of, you know, we, we kind of talked about some of the groups that are, you know, that are organizing. This was, I, I was told that, that Patriot Front, which is this group here, that some of them were in attendance at the Capitol building. Uh, you know, not in a, as great a number as perhaps or dressed up as they are here and, and perhaps not as noticeable either. And I guess, yeah, that kind of falling back into the woodwork. I mean, the Proud Boys announced ahead of time that they weren't going to be in full uniform, you know, in the kind of signature black and gold, uh, you know, uh, for which they are known. And they're, you know, also there too, you know, so there's just a lot of uh, folks. And I guess that's, you know, that's what's something, you know, is kind of uh, disturbing, you know, the kind of just regular folks, you know, that are really, uh, quite enamored, you know, of this kind of uh, authoritarian uh, 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 tactics and, you know, and, and, and calls and this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, what, what do you say about that, about, you know, what, what does it say about, you know, kind of, you know, this, 
um, drift, you know, that we have uh, toward authoritarianism, uh, you know, that, that, that's going on. Oh, and, and I should say, sorry, to the audience, please do um, put uh, your questions in the, in the Q&A section so that we'll have those, sorry. So I think part of the um, challenge of talking about fascism and authoritarianism in the US is that it often comes against this backdrop of assuming that America was a perfectly well-functioning democracy up until the point that whether it was um, a certain strain of the Republican party or that Donald Trump appeared on the scene and now all of a sudden we're vulnerable to fascism. And I think one of the things that you learn from studying fascism but that you also learn from studying US history is it is a it is a politics with mass appeal, um, even in um, formerly democratic places. Um, it it that is in fact one of the main features of fascism is its ability to rile and inspire uh, the masses. But also that American democracy has not only been imperfect, but many people have experienced it as a kind of authoritarian rule with no civil rights. Um, with no real access to uh, the benefits of citizenship. Um, and, you know, this is something that we don't have to look overseas to understand these trend lines in the United States. We don't need foreign examples of what authoritarian looks like because we can dig through our own history and find plenty of examples, not only of Americans being attracted to authoritarianism, but Americans enacting authoritarianism as a form of government um, in local and regional places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that said, we also have to understand that there, despite the fact that this is something that is very, very American and, and very American to its core, there are connections with the international mm -hmm. uh, far right movements as well that we that we should be aware of. This is, it's a, Interplay. There's a feedback mechanism that that happens. So I live in I live in Germany. I'm in I'm in Berlin at the moment, um, and there's a, a a far right movement in Germany. There's a far right movement that has actual political power and is in the um, the Bundestag um, as well. Um, in addition, there are QAnon like movements. QAnon has a following in Germany, which doesn't even make sense if you look at the mythology of QAnon. Right. Um, it's a different state. How can you have a deep state? Um, so the, we have to look at how these movements play off of one another. Mm -hmm. And we also have to understand that the networking effects of the power drivers of these movements is also international. And so we see that these groups network internationally, they take influence from each other internationally, and they swing influence away from where the, the, the lens of the media is. So I, I expect that in the crackdowns on the far right that are, is due to follow um, following 2020, that we're going to see a lot more investment by the far right into the European movements. Mm -hmm. um, and this is already starting to happen. We see it in France, we see it in, uh, in Germany. It's in dire situations in Poland and Hungary and Romania at the moment. Um, and so I think that there is, you know, we don't we don't want to look at this sort of fascism as a, as an import, um, but we have to look at it as something that is imported and exported. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I remember the morning of um, August the twelfth. You know, at the riot rally, uh, Golden Dawn. You know, a fascist group. Again, these are self identified fascists. You know, from, from from Greece. You know, sending greetings over to their brethren. You know, as they were. Mm -hmm. Um, preparing to march. So yeah, and we have, you know, of course, there are these international networks, uh, uh, you know, conferences and the like, you know, that these folks, um, you know, traffic in and, and, and of course, the, you know, the, the, the leaders to whom they look and here I'm talking about Trump, you know, uh, you know, seems to favor authoritarian leaders, you know, whether it's Duterte in the Philippines or Erdogan and, in, in, you know, in, 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 in Hungary, or, uh, you know, you know, so many other, uh, uh, Places, you know, Bolsonaro in Brazil, you know, uh, or sorry, is that Erdogan in Turkey and, and Orban in, in Hungary, I meant, you know, um, that, that uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of this uh, making it seem okay, you know, that this kind of anti democratic uh, um, movement. Yeah. 
And you saw figures like Steve Bannon um, after 2017 go abroad and, you know, attempt to help foster some of this. And it, it underscores some of the importance of January 6th far beyond U.S. borders, because not only does it um, provide inspiration to these movements abroad, but to places with um, hardcore authoritarian governments already. I mean, Erdogan was commenting on what had happened in the United States. And it's something that authoritarian regimes can point to and say, look, this is what democracy looks like. This is what you get um, with a democratic government. And it um, diminishes the power of the United States to the extent that it has a kind of moral authority for ideas like democracy and civil rights and human rights. Um, this was a, a deeply damaging event internationally as well as at home. And, and it, there's an interesting thing about this um, because a couple of months ago here in, in Berlin, um, as everywhere else, we're struggling with uh, coronavirus in Germany. And despite what the American media says, Germany is not handling it as well at, or as rosily as um, it appears in some some English language media, mm -hmm. um, and like everything else, like in the U.S., we've we've had anti-lockdown demonstrations. And two months ago, maybe I forget exactly when there was a, a fairly large anti-lockdown demonstration in Berlin mm -hmm. um, that looked much in in character, much like what we saw at the Capitol. It was a movement called uh, the Kredenken movement, um, which is like a, it, it translates to lateral thinkers. It's a mix of QAnon and anti-vaxxers and neo-Nazis and even like hippies, right? All mixed in together. And they stormed the Reichstag. They broke through the police lines. They didn't get inside of the building, but they got to the steps. And that was their goal. It was to just get to the steps of the Reichstag. And this was a huge deal in Germany. And it got very little international um, uh, awareness. And so we can see that these, the, the, these parallels are there and these pieces are, are being put together. And we have to stop thinking about this as um, incidental, unrelated things mm -hmm. and, and more of a pattern of we are a movement that is going to frame itself as against the mainstream and we're going to literally um, take the status quo. We're going to storm the status quo. Yeah. I'm wondering if we can pull up, I wanna pull up another image just to, to look at and to kind of analyze together if we can. Um, and this was uh, on the late morning of January the 6th. Uh, this is you know, in front of the White House. Uh, and this is where you know, there's a rally here and, and, and uh, Trump is, you know, kind of exhorts the troops. And then, and then it, it's, it's after this that they march down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol building. Um, and I mean, I don't know, for those of us that, that study the far right and fascist movements, this is a really uh, chilling uh, uh, image here. And, and I guess what I wanna ask is, I mean, well, uh, we hope uh, Trump is leaving office, um, but, but you know, we have here this, this coalescing, as we said earlier, you know, kind of around a, uh, an authoritarian figure, you know, who, you know, to, to them at least, to these followers is, is, is charismatic. Um, um, and, and, you know, but what, what happens uh, when he's gone, when he's not in office, you know, when you've got this, you know, this kind of cult, cult of personality following, you know, what's, what happens here? Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's, we're at a scary point because um, I think even when he's out of power, um, he's going to pose a serious, if not scarier threat. Um, and, you know, he's still going to be the leader of this cult, you could call it, with a, like a completely fanatical following. Um, and I think, you know, as he leaves power, um, he's going to become more unhinged and unleashed. Um, and that kind of, he's going to call on his followers a lot more. Um, and I think we're going to see that kind of fascistic bond, like, uh, strengthen and deepen. Um, so, yeah, just because he's going to leave office doesn't mean he's not going to be dangerous. Yeah, I think one of the stories of the past few days has been 
you know, you had now we just saw 10 Republicans vote to impeach the president. You saw all of these corporations come out and um, start to withhold donations from the Republicans who voted to stop the certification of the election. <clears throat> and so partly that story can be read as, oh, look, Donald Trump's support is collapsing. It's finally happening. Um, and certainly his approval ratings um, at 34 percent are the lowest they've been through the entirety of his administration. But that also does serve a storyline that Trump has been selling his supporters, mm -hmm. that it's us against them, mm -hmm. that um, all of these elites, the Liz Cheney's of the world, the, um, the Marriott's of the world mm -hmm. are out to get you and they're out to get me. And there actually is no difference between them being out to get you and being out to get me. And that is a, a powerful storyline that is only going to be strengthened by the events of the past few days. That doesn't mean that the events of the past few days were wrong. I think that if we're starting to think about what a pro-democracy alliance looks like, um, it's nice to see it growing a little bit. Um, but it does mean that we shouldn't think of ourselves as out of the woods here um, because we're entering a new dangerous part of this cycle. What it will look like when Donald Trump is no longer on social media, how he learns to communicate with his supporters, that's going to shape a lot of this. Um, but it, it is not the time for one to let one's guard down, I would say. Yeah, and I would just, um, the, when you bring up victimhood, Nikki, um, that's like a really good way to think about um, all the Trump rallies I've been to, because they're basically carnivals of victimhood, right? Like where, you know, Trump is basically, you know, just kind of riffs on everyone who's done him wrong that week. Um, and then, you know, he tells the people in the crowd who they need to hate and they, mm -hmm. and then they hate them. Um, you know, and like I was at the rally, for example, where um, the crowd broke into a chant of uh, send her back, send her back about Johan Omar. Um, you know, and earlier that week, of course, the president had tweeted that she, even though, you know, of course, Johan Omar is a congresswoman, she's a citizen and yada, 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 to go back to where she came from. Um, you know, the, his his followers picked up on that and, and then, you know, re repeated it back to him. <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, concerning. I don't see this genie getting stuff back into the bottle, you know, after the... Um after the inauguration, you know, and, and yeah, and, and we, we you know, need to be ever uh, vigilant. I, I'm, you know, thinking of a, a, a phrase from um, Jason Stanley, who's the author of uh, the book, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. And we've been talking about this kind of polarization that, that uh, uh, you know, kind of fuels a lot of, of, of <clears throat> the MAGA movement, you know, and, uh, and, and, Stanley says that fascism succeeds by making talk of fascism seem outlandish, mm. you know? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, do, do any of you have a, you know, kind of commentary on that? What do you think? I mean, this goes to what Emily was saying earlier about um, the Q shaman coming in there with his um, horns on his head and his funny costume um, and, you know, some members of the press biting and being like, oh, look at these buffoons who are like waddling their way through the Capitol. I mean, that's part of the tactic is to make this seem silly. And this has been a tactic um, of the alt-right in the period from 2014 to 2017 and from these other far-right movements um, in the year since. And so it's something to pay attention to. It is worth noting that uh, people who have talked about fascism over the past five years have often been ridiculed for using that word. Um, and in fact, Robert Paxton, who is one of the leading scholars on fascism himself was not willing to apply the word fascism mm -hmm. to the Trump regime until after the Capitol attack when he came out and he said, look, I thought the missing ingredient was political violence. Here's your political violence. Right. We need to start using the language of fascism. And so having um, sort of a, an elite gatekeeper like that come forward and say, all right, Time to start using the word fascism um, can be helpful. I would argue that Paxton seems to have missed quite a significant amount of political violence prior to right. January 6th. Um, <clears throat> but the most important thing is that people are on board. So we can use the, the F word now. We, we he says we can, yes. Yeah. I, I, think, I think Paxton's uh, unwillingness to, to use the, the F word to, or to, and to recognize the political violence that has happened is deeply entwined with this, uh, what Jelaine describes as um, this uh, 
way that fascism makes talking about fascism look ridiculous, right? It's <clears throat> all about civility politics, which itself is a form of white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? There was political violence, but who was the political violence against? It wasn't against the halls of power. It was against the black people and the queer people and the trans people and the poor people, right? Who dared to go out in the streets to oppose it. And so that was like, oh, that's not political violence because I don't have to think about it because I don't see me in those groups. You know, in Charlottesville, they, they stood on the steps of, of what is now Market Street Park and they were chanting, F U F slur. They were they were using all of these slurs, right? This was deeply political <clears throat> uh, violence for them. Mm -hmm. But because we're wrapped in this idea of oh, democracy can oh, democracy and civility are two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. it makes it so that we don't feel like we're being serious, or we when we talk about fascism, we don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So for me, those things are very very intertwined. And it's sad that it took an attack on the halls of power to recognize the violence of these movements as fascist violence. It's a privilege that a lot of us don't have. Yeah. There's a, a question here um, that, that just asks for more detail on political violence before January 6th. And I think that Emily's laid a lot of it out really well, but even just within the Trump movement, um, Donald Trump from the early days of his campaign called for political violence from his supporters against protesters. Um, he himself um, tried to embody this idea that he could commit acts of political violence um, with his famous Fifth Avenue saying um, his tacit support for the violence in Charlottesville, um, his support of police when he would talk to police officers and say that they should rough up the people who they have in their custody. There, there's a, a long line of both violence encouraged by Trump, um, but then also the violence that we saw at state houses and, and places like that, that all weave together to suggest that this was a movement dedicated to political violence long before January 6th. And, and I would add that <clears throat> there is, I mean, there's been so much political violence. And I, and I think it's the, the, the media hasn't always framed it as such um, and has often um, ignored um, the political implications of some acts of violence. Um, I, you know, one of, one of the big projects I've done over the last couple of years was with ProPublica, and we gathered 800 hate incidents in which a perpetrator said some variation of go back to your country, um, and then analyzed those situations. And we found that a quarter of those incidents invoked Donald Trump's name or his campaign slogans. Right. Um, and, you know, literally using the president as a weapon. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I was talking to a historian about this and I think that's, you know, obviously America has a, a long history of political violence, um, but to have a president and his campaign invoked in that manner is somewhat unprecedented. Um, you know, I'm not a historian, but I think y'all can, you can discuss that. Um, and then, you know, I'll never forget also, we had, there was this militia uh, plot to massacre Somalis in Kansas um, that I covered, but that was never talked about in terms of Trump supporters or as in pro-Trump extremists, even though they were literally plotting their attack on the day after the election because they didn't want to mess up Trump's 2016 election chances. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many stories like this. Right. Um, and then, you know, very quickly to pivot back to the discussion about the F word, um, just a quick anecdote. Um, when I was covering a Trump rally in Orlando once, um, some Proud Boys found out that I was there um, and knew that I described them as neo-fascists in articles. Mm -hmm. And about 20 of them surrounded me. Um, you know, they weren't attacking me, but they were around me. They came up to me um, and demanded to for me to explain to them why I called them fascists and for me to define fascism to them. Um, and I, I think it just kind of goes to the power of calling these people for what they are because it does rattle them. Um, and the other part of that, I, I, I did not get into debate debate with them about what fascism is because you don't debate fascists. But anyway, that's, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I've heard these laments, you know, a, after the attacks at the Capitol building, you know, which is similar to what we heard here in Charlottesville after the Unite the Right, that oh, this isn't Charlottesville. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and then, you know, some of us that do public history and even myself and some of my public historian colleagues have to do a lot of work to say, actually, there's a long history here of white supremacist violence. You know, there is. Yeah. And similarly, uh, you know, those that say, you know, after the Capitol attacks, you know, last week, this is not America, but, but it is, you know, I mean, it's in our national history I and mean, particularly, you know, during reconstruction, you know, there were several local and state governments that were overthrown you know, by, uh, you know, violent terrorists. Now this, you know, is the first, you know, a- attempt at a national level of, of, the, of a coup d'etat, you know, but that happened at a local and state level, you know, in, in the U.S. South after the, you know, after reconstruction. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing. Um, I wanna uh, just in a couple minutes, um, open us up to, to, uh, uh, to Q&A here. Um, and let's maybe, uh, let's see, I've got, some questions that are coming in here. Um, start with a media related question. So Christopher, uh, for you. Um, what are some concrete ways for activists to actually achieve change among media outlets? Hmm. Uh, great question. Um, to change to achieve change among media outlets. Or maybe um, maybe they mean to change the media narrative or something, I, I, I'm kind of. Well, I mean, I think, um, I think, I think um, one of the main things that we need to tackle, and I don't know exactly how we tackle this, but um, Nikki, you had that great op-ed in CNN this week about mm-hmm. um, the idea of false equivalence. And, um, and I think, as dangerous as Fox and Newsmax and and OWN and kind of that right wing media sphere is, I actually think one of the most insidious things we're up against is our kind of um, uh, biggest, most mainstream media outlets Mm -hmm. um, doing a lot of these false equivalencies where they think that, you know, there's somehow an equivalence between the, dem- the Black Lives Matter demonstrations we saw over the summer and what happened at the Capitol. And this kind of very, um, you know, they operate with these platitudes that um, all political violence is bad without understanding the underlying structure of that violence. Um, and I think when it comes to activists actually achieving that change among media outlets, um, I don't know, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out myself in media. Um, and, I, and I think like you, I think we just have to keep the pressure on. Um, I think especially amongst uh, our like biggest outlets like the Times and the Post and, and CNN and, and MSNBC um, to like really work to reframe that discussion. And if I could piggyback on that. I mean, one of the things that I actually found really effective that activists did after Charlottesville was to say, I'm not going to participate in any media projects that platform yes. yep. neo-Nazis or that platform white nationalists and holding to that line. So having thought about media ethics, having thought about amplification, having thought mm-hmm. about what your line was, you came forward and you said, I will participate in this project if this condition is met. And you were able to explain why that was your red line. And I think that mm-hmm. did have an effect on how some outlets covered um, white supremacy in that moment. And that that does make a difference. And that might be an exception, but I think being able to have media ethics conversations when you're talking to a reporter can have an impact. Absolutely. And, uh, and I, I, I just had really, really, sorry, go ahead, Emily. Oh, uh, thanks. I was, I was gonna say, I was part of the media collective, both uh, during and be, you know before and after the, the major events um, in Charlottesville. And we really wanted to change this, this dynamic, right? Because a lot of times within activist groups, we get upset when the media doesn't cover things the way that we think that they should be covered, but we don't do the work to build the relationships to, um, with the reporters to get, to make sure that our story is being told the right way to try to get the messaging of the intention of what we're doing across and, um, and then, and then building on and having those standards and, and, um, uh, being selective about who you work with and, and doing that. And, you know, I, I've worked with certain journalists for a number of years now um, in covering this. And I've been, I've been a source for many people. I've um, been, you know, on background for lots of things. 
And it's a result of uh, building up that, that relationship of, of trust. And yeah, you know, even if you do that, doesn't mean that they're gonna cover it the way that you want it to, but the coverage is a lot better and you have to start moving towards it because that's what the right is doing. The right is in the, the they're texting reporters nonstop, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the at Twitter feed, Jim Acosta is saying, you know, as the riots are unfolding in the Capitol, he's saying a source in the White House is telling me that they're, you, they're talking to the rioters. It's like, a, a who's a, in the what talking to whom? And also, yeah. why do you yeah. have those connections? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that we have to interrogate like where that trust is and, and how do we replicate that uh -huh. within the activist communities? Yeah. Right. yeah it takes a, a certain amount of, of discipline on the part of uh, activists too, to not just, you know, want to talk to any old journalist that, that comes along. It's, it's certainly true. And, you know, in Charlottesville activists, uh, you know, really did, you know, kind of lay down a bright line there. And, you know, if, if you want to talk to us, well, we're, you know, there are, you know, certain conditions, you know. Um, I'm wondering, let's see, we've got a few more questions here about, uh, about the character of the groups uh, that, that have been uh, doing this. Um, is there a geographic area of the country that uh, is disproportionately represented? Um, and are the movements growing? Um, Let's start with that, yeah. So one way I'll answer this question, there's a great um, way to visualize this. So uh, the social media network that a lot of these MAGA folks were using um, was this sort of new social media network called Parlay. Mm -hmm. um, spelled, it's spelled like Parler and a lot of people call it Parler, but apparently it's pronounced Parlay in the French way. Um, Parlay got shut down, but before they got shut down, there was a hacker who downloaded and archived all of the materials. And it turns out that this network was not well engineered. And so it had a lot of uh, geographic data along with the media, the videos and the images that were being posted to this network. When you plot those out, you don't get a large distribution of people in rural centers. And it's not in the South and it's not in the Midwest. The vast majority of these posts were being done in cities in our coastal elite areas, right? Um, so there's no, there's, you know, some groups are, are, they have their strongest coalitions in some cities, like in Portland, there's a, a strong co a contingent of, of Proud Boys and, and related groups. Um, Patriot Front mostly operates in the South, so on and so forth, but this is geographically distributed. It's, it's not, um, from any one part of the country. Might some of that, you know, the, this, this concentration in, in urban areas for, for <clears throat> Parley um, be due to the fact that it's a relatively new platform? I mean, it's only a month or two old, right? I mean, everybody's on Facebook. And so I imagine there might be more distribution, but the kind of early adopters might be the more tech savvy folks that are associated with the urban areas. I don't know if that's fair, but. I wouldn't call them super tech savvy having looked at some of the comments when uh, <laughs> things were trying to get taken down. Um, you know, you certainly have to condition around the fact that if you plot any sort of population, you're going to see the, the population centers, no matter what you do. Um, but, it, you know, there, the, so you have to consider that. So there, there are maybe some factors around tech literacy, access to technology, mm -hmm. um, things like that. But, uh, but by and large, I mean, you know, look at these, look at the indictments that are coming out. You know, these are guys that are traveling from New York. They're traveling from, from, from major cities. They're traveling you know, from Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, second biggest city in the country. So. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, got, a, got a question here about the intersection of fascism and Christian nationalism. Um, okay. just, the person says it was much more on display last week than in Seville. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah, the religious engagement in Seville was pretty much anti-fascist as I recall. So they're talking about the, um, uh, religious activists in 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 Charlottesville that confronted uh, uh, the alt right then. But what about you know fascism and Christian nationalism right now? I sort of recall um, that back in this early phase of the alt right in the pre twenty seventeen era, there was a sort of 
if not as a sort of secularism um, to it, which in this new manifestation, and Christopher will know more about this, the Groypers are much more um, Christianist in some of their identities and much more willing to embrace um, for various types of evangelicalism and, and uh, conservative social policy. But I think that it also speaks to the broadness of the MAGA coalition, which of course is going to have tons of white evangelicals because that's what the, the base of the Republican party looks like. And so um, the Trump movement itself is I think far more Christianist than what you would have seen in Charlottesville. Um, even though, you know, they borrow from crusade imagery and things like that. Um, it's not really rooted. It wasn't really rooted in a kind of um, active um, uh, religiosity. Yeah, I noticed that one of the um, insurrectionists, uh, you know, went on the Senate floor with the Christian flag, you know, that is in so many uh, Christian congregations around this country. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have too much to add to that. I think that's absolutely correct. I think like, you know, it goes back to what we were saying earlier that like, if you want to build a broader nationalist fascist coalition, you have to allow Christians in that coalition in America. Allow. No. <laughs> yeah, well, allow, well, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here um, they were. Yeah, very much part of the of the infrastructure, definitely. Right. Uh -huh. um, and um, you know, I'd also just add that I think one of the things. This is kind of a tangent, but I think one of the things that we haven't talked about enough in with these last four years um, is kind of um, identifying how explicit um, Islamophobia is allowed in. Um, modern American discourse um, and how that is such a fundamental part of this fascist moment. Um, and so when we're talking about Christian nationalism, especially um, and kind of like, you know, the, um, the way they have co-opted um, cr like crusader imagery and stuff is explicitly um, anti-Muslim. The way we hear people talk about the preservation of Judeo-Christian culture. Mm -hmm. That term Judeo-Christian um, is very much a part of the anti-Muslim, uh, mm -hmm. you know, part of this coalition. Um, and I think there's just, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, around that. Yeah, right. We've got several kinds of questions that are kind of clustering around uh, the issue of, um, what are the best track tactics and strategies to confront, constrain, marginalize this movement? You know, um, yeah. What What are the most constructive ways to to confront these movements? So there's in the anti-fascist scene, we talk about a diversity of tactics, and um, sometimes that is meant in a way that is um, to to justify the use of violence in the street as a last resort, um, as a moral necessity. Um, but what it really means is that there's a lot of ways that you can um, combat fascism and confronting, physically confronting them in the street, as I mentioned, is a last resort. There's a lot of uh, activism around doing things like exposing them, you know, uh, so quote unquote doxing them, um, exposing them to social repercussions of what they post online, um, linking their real identities to their online identities. Um, which can have the effect of getting them fired or getting them socially ostracized. And it raises, raises the social cost. There's also the legal avenues. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting about what happened in, in Charlottesville with Unite the Right is you've got all of this HD video and this, this you know, high resolution photography showing these guys, right? Committing violence. There's an image that I, I see all the time. It's of this, this fascist by the name of Will Fears and he's wearing this like blue button down shirt in Charlottesville and he's carrying this flag on a flagpole and he's using it to thrust at people and, and, and stab at people. And he's, he's got this video where he's saying, you know, come on, fire the first shot in the race war. Yeah. He was well known to anti-fascists before that. We identified him, we pinned him to the videos in, you know, days after the, the events. We said, this is him. Law enforcement let him get away with it. They didn't prosecute him. He was never... There were no charges ever brought against him for what he did in Charlottesville, despite the fact that he was on video hitting people with a torch on August 11th, on video hitting people with flags on August 12th. A couple months later, he goes down to Gainesville, Florida for a Richard Spencer rally, gives a ton of interviews to the media, 
um, in him and his brother, including to Christopher, who's, and Christopher writes up one of the greatest quotes of all time that I'll let him describe um, momentarily. But he's allowed to get away with this, right? Goes down at this rally, rally gets effectively shut down. Everybody, you know, disperses. There's a lot of tension. Him and his, him and his brother and two other guys get in this Jeep. There's a confrontation. The other guy, Tyler Tenbrink, gets out of the Jeep, pulls a gun, shoots at an anti-fascist. Misses him, thankfully. Um, but those guys all got arrested. Um, two of them were convicted for attempted murder or accessory to attempted murder for that event. Will Fears goes gets um, released from jail on a technicality and gets extradited to Texas, where he's also facing charges um, for strangling his girlfriend. Um, so now he's in prison for five years. But all of this could have been avoided had law enforcement actually gone and prosecuted the people for committing violence on camera. And so that's one of the ways that we need to see, um, as much as I hate to say that we need to use or, or um, have the state come in, it is an effective way of, of shutting down this movement and preventing the next thing. And the next thing is, is just around the corner. What was that quote, um, Christopher? You wanna tell us? <laughs> yeah, I actually just pulled it up. Um, <clears throat> so this was, I and mean, I can't remember if this was Will or his brother Colt. It might've been his brother. I think it was um, Colton. It was Colton, yeah. Um, but he, he said, I, I forget what I asked him, but I asked him like why he was in town or something for the Spencer Valley. And he said, basically, I'm just fed up with the fact that I'm cisgendered, I'm a white male and I lean right towards the Republican side, said Fears, 26, wearing a pin of the third SS Panzer Division, totem cop of the Waffen SS. And I get demonized if I don't accept certain things. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, but uh, it was, it was a really good expression. I thought of like, um, you know, why fascists become fascists, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, back to the original question about what, how to confront these arguments, um, I'll answer it from a media, um, perspective, which is that, um, uh, I think there's just a giant, uh, learning deficit, um, to covering fascists, but also especially anti-fascists. Um, and, you know, when I first started covering this stuff, um, there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. And it was, it was, it was a big learning curve, but every, every beat in media is, is a big learning curve. Um, and I think, you know, fundamentally what American journalism needs to reckon with is that, you know, if you, I, in my opinion, you know, if you want to write about this stuff, you have to start you have to start with the basis of yourself being an anti-fascist. And I think like American journalists need to understand themselves as anti-fascist and that should not be a controversial thing to say. Um, and, you know, we kind of need to rethink um, what we mean by objectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I, I don't know, I think that's just from, from, my, from my perspective, one of the bigger, bigger uh, angles to tackle. And, and also I think like, you know, another thing is like repercussions for people in our industry that have been so complicit over the last four years. Um, Fox News employees, for example, should not be allowed to play company um, in, in media circles. Um, and I think that's something that we need to be a lot better at. Yeah, and I would just add and sort of underscoring both of these points, I mean, there has to be an acceptance of this as a threat. Like we can't keep bumbling through the next several years and decades, um, continuing with this kind of naivete about this as a, a violent threat, not just that endangers lives, but again, that endangers American democracy. And then we need to tackle the question of incentives. I don't think that this is something that we can regulate our way out of. I don't think that this is something that, um, you know, you can create a tech fix for because it's a social and political problem. But right now in our political system and in many of our media systems, um, this far right conspiracy theories, far right politics are incentivized. They're monetized. Um, there are, um, I think they're getting better, but there are systems that sort of push people deeper and deeper down a radicalization rabbit hole. And so the more that we can de-incentivize, not just on the far right, but like de-incentivize for politicians. Um, I mean, one of the things that we saw 
on January 6th was politicians with bodies still warm going in and voting to overturn the election. How do you de-incentivize that within the Republican Party? Because that's going to need to happen if we're going to have a way back out of this. Um, so there are a lot of different fronts on which this fight has to be fought um, with a commitment to anti-fascism and with a commitment to pro-democracy. Um, and those have to be kind of the core values going forward as people think about what their politics are and what their activism looks like is that it, it may seem kind of crazy to just say, yes, I believe in democracy. And that's like a core value for me going forward, but that's a contested value and we need to treat it as a contested value and continue to make the arguments for it and shape our activism and politics in support of democratic governance um, against fascism and also towards justice. Okay. Yeah, you know, I kind of following up on on this, you know, you know not being naive, you know, is, is how you put it, Nicole. And I, I think that's been a slower process than some of us, you know, uh, would have liked, you know, to, over the past several years for, you know, kind of more of a kind of more general or mainstream audience coming around to the fact that, yes, this actually is dangerous. And the, and the whole like... Uh, uh, both sidesism, you know, that, 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 you know, often kind of journalists are kind of trained to be neutral or objective or the, this sort of thing. And I, I appreciate what you said there, Christopher, about, you know, it, it really shouldn't be controversial as a journalist to have a starting point as, you know, being anti-fascist, you know. Um, but we, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> it, it, along with the kind of, you know, sort of both sidesism is, is the, the, the whataboutism, you know, is, it, is there something on the left that, that it's going on here too? I mean, I remember that, you know, Emily and I, you know, here, here in Charlottesville, you know, we, there was a lot of fear about that. There was more fear about uh, the anti-fascists than there was about the actual fascists, you know, prior to uh, Unite the Right. And so how do you, you know, respond to that, you know, those kinds of questions about, you know, kind of fears of, of you know, kind of left boogeyman that is somehow, a, you know, a, a, an equivalent uh, counterweight to, to the right. My answer to that is, uh, you know, when you start seeing left-wing groups going into <clears throat> right-wing cities with the explicit intention of starting trouble, then we can talk. But that's not, that's not happening. You know, there's no equivalence between, between the, the right and the yeah. left, there, yeah. there just isn't. Um, you know, we have to separate, we, we look at race and justice in the US through an anti-discrimination lens. It's what we're trained to do, that we shouldn't treat people different on the basis of their skin color, of their gender, of their religion. Mm -hmm. That's a very nice thing, but it doesn't address the existing power dynamics. And to understand left versus right politics, mm -hmm. you have to understand that there is a set of people who have a position of power and there's a set of people who are in positions of being oppressed. Um, and the ways in which the law and the structures of our mm -hmm. society treat people, even when looking at an anti-discrimination lens, does not address the oppressions that people are, are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so there's no, we can't look at acts as morally, as having some sort of moral quality to them. You mm -hmm. know, if I punch, if I punch somebody in the face, right, and they're a random person walking on the street, I think we can all agree that's probably pretty bad. If I punch somebody in the face who's about to stab somebody, that's, that's, that's actually pretty good because I'm doing something that is helping somebody. I'm doing something that is preventing a greater violence from happening. So when we look at the riots over, over the summer, we can't just say, oh, rioting is bad. We have to look at what is the riot being done for? What is it that they are protesting? And why has it gotten to the point that the protest has gone to the point of burning down a police precinct or smashing a Starbucks window? Mm -hmm. So we have to separate the act from the intention of the act in the conditions that have led up to the act. Um, and so I think that it's there's no, there's no equivalence between somebody wanting to riot because they want police to stop killing them and somebody wanting to riot because they literally want to install a king. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right. Um, we've got questions, you know, along the lines of, you know, how to combat this, you know, how to confront this. And, and uh, a question gets asked, are there historical examples of fascist movements that were successfully dismantled without war 
after reaching the far the point to the, at the, that the far right has reached now in the U.S. Are there historical examples, or you know, or what, what what's to be done? Is kind of the question I'm I'm seeing here. I mean, the Jim Crow South was dismantled without war. Um, it was dismantled through grassroots activism. Um, there was a lot of violence, obviously, and I think we need to reimagine what we think <clears throat> civil unrest and civil war actually look like going forward. Um, but it was something that was dismantled through activism. It was something that was dismantled um, through influence on politics. Um, so there, there certainly is an example. And there were fascist and pro-fascist forces in the United States in the 1930s. And you would say ultimately <laughs> war did that, but there was also a thriving anti-fascist movement in the United right. States that helped to dismantle um, those fascist movements in the US and keep them from obtaining the kind of power that they sought and that they had examples of in other countries. There was every reason for fascists in the United States in the 1930s to think that they could come to power because they watched it happen um, in several countries all across Europe. And so there certainly are examples, but I think one of the big lessons that it uh, teaches us is that you have to recognize the threat very early. You have to address the threat as a serious threat early on, and you have to have connections to power. I mean, that's, I mean, the big story of dismantling Jim Crow was slowly over time building alliances um, and pressure groups in order to um, force the dismantling of Jim Crow. Um, although, again, that's a it's another cautionary tale because look how many decades uh, it took. There, there's, would, there's, sorry, go ahead, Christopher. I've talked a lot. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to say, like, kind of pay you a compliment, Emily, is that, like, um, you know, as scary as this moment is and you know, as um, big and emboldened as this kind of MAGA fascist movement is, um, I think we also shouldn't take away from the, the successes over the last four years um, since Charlottesville. I mean, if you if we look at the organizers of that rally, they're all, they're they're a fucking mess now, you know, like like they're they're pariahs. The other F word. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the other F word. Yeah, um, but like you know, they're completely disorganized and disbanded um, because of the work of anti-fascists to um, you know expose them and deplatform them and and you know kind of put you know create a social cost for being in those groups um so you know obviously we're dealing with a different beast now maybe it's still kind of the same beast obviously but you know i think we can look at the total dissolution of groups like identity europa and um you know even patriot front to a certain degree i mean patriot front like grew out of a group vanguard america i believe which you know james alex fields was a part of in, in charlottesville um and they had to rebrand because you know, they couldn't operate as Vanguard America. And, and this is all because of the work of anti-fascists. It's, it's just, just a small example. There, there's also related to that, a very significant court case that's going on in Charlottesville called Signs v. Kessler. So mm -hmm. a bunch of people who are injured during that weekend have sued many of the organizers and participants of, of the rally. And what's interesting is, so Signs v. Kessler has had a, a devastating effect. I mean, it has bankrupted many of these people um, many of them can't even hire lawyers. They're, they're, they're defending themselves in court because they just can't afford a lawyer anymore, including Richard Spencer, by the way. Um, but what's interesting is the, the core claim in Science v. Kessler is around a section of the United States Code, 42 uh, United States Code, section 1983. And that code is the incorporation of the 14th Amendment, which came into, a, into effect um, during Reconstruction, it was one of the amendments that was um, uh, passed following the Civil War. Um, and the amendment itself does not grant any, any sort of, uh, it's the Equal Protection Clause, but it doesn't actually grant any enforcement power. Um, 1983 is the enforcement power as um, created by Congress. And when Congress created that act, it was actually not till many years after the 14th Amendment. And it was an act that was called the KKK Act. And so it was this legislative and legal um, uh, response to this growing um, threat of the KKK, of the first Klan. Um, or was it the second Klan? I, I can't remember. First. Um, no, it was, it was the first Klan. Was it? Yeah, there, I mean, there was yeah, legislation against the Klan in yeah. the 1870s, 1871, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so you, there's actually a legacy um, of successfully dismantling um, proto-fascist and, and white supremacist movements through legal action. And that legacy is carried on through, um, through you know, uh, the Jim Crow era, through the civil rights era, and is still being litigated in Charlottesville still today. Um, and I think that that is a, a significant legacy of um, this sort of multifaceted anti-fascism. Um, okay. And so hopefully we'll, we'll see when that case goes to trial this year, um, what, what happens with it. Uh, I have a lot of hopes, um, but it, the, the historical connections are there and I think they're super important. Yeah, we'll see if the defendants can find legal representation. <laughs> that is because there aren't, I mean, I talk about the social costs of being a fascist. You know, nobody wants to represent them. Very few people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, kind of last question as as we're as we're um, wrapping up here is, you know, does this <clears throat> attack at the Capitol building represent a kind of a tipping point, or is it a trend that'll repeat itself? Or you know, or or you know, what can we do to make sure that that isn't the case? I guess you know, is it you know, so tipping point or trend or where are we going from here? So I think that the far right sees this as a huge success and are going to try things like this again, not at the US Capitol probably anytime soon because it's uh, pretty heavily guarded at the moment, but certainly at state Capitol buildings um, and, and other <clears throat> probable attacks in Washington DC over time. I think though, ultimately like where we go from here depends on the choices that we make. This is not something that is determined. And so what kind of political will we have, um, how much listening people are doing to experts who, um, Think about these things and have thought about how best to respond to them, looking directly at Emily and Christopher right now, um, will determine how this develops going forward. Are we going to um, continue to treat these groups as if they're not really a serious threat? If we do, then we're just inviting, I think, even more violence going forward. Um, but I think that we're in a dangerous moment because I think this was a pretty big success for these groups or seen as a big success for them. Yeah, I get concerned sometimes when I hear these kind of uh, uh, old uh, nostrums about, well, what we really need is more civil discourse. And I don't know how I'm to have civil discourse with people who believe in these conspiracy theories, you know, who are just disconnected from reality. I, I don't know with whom to have the discourse, I guess, you know, is, is, is a question, but uh, um, and one that, you know, thinking about going forward, I guess, you know, the kind of alliance building, you know, coalition building that, you know, Emily, you talked about, you know, kind of this history, you know, going, you know, through the, uh, through the Southern United States is, you know, kind of finding, finding the persuadables, I guess, is, is good. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So tipping point or, you know, Christopher, do you have tipping point or turning point or? Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, just piggybacking on what Nikki said, I, I think it's, um, a real success for the far right. Um, and we're gonna have to be extra vigilant over the next couple of years. Um, I think we're in this for the long haul. Um, I think, you know, from what I've seen on the ground that like we're dealing with a fanatically loyal um, kind of movement that's loyal to its, to its leader. Um, and there's just gonna be a lot of work um, you know, I think like we could be entering a new phase. Um, I don't know. We just don't know what that phase looks like yet. I think, um, you know, like we talked about before, the Capitol was kind of, you know, there was a lot of steps that had to happen for the Capitol to happen. You know, we, there was these anti-lockdown protests all summer where people were breaching state capitals, for example, um, and now they've reached the U.S. Capitol. What's the next step? I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, we could be, we've also just been seeing, seeing the development of like kind of, um, you know, more, what's the term? Is it stochiastic terrorism? Right? Stochastic like the, terrorism. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, basically kind of this idea of leaders, leaderless resistance and like acts of terror uh, committed by individual people. Um, and that's certainly something I'm thinking about um, after the inauguration. All right. Well, I want to um, thank our audience for, we went a few minutes over, but we still have, you know, many people who uh, wanted to, to continue with us. And I want to thank, uh, thank them and also thank 
um, our panelists for contributing your expertise to this uh, to this discussion that really, really needed to happen, you know, and uh, also want to thank the Democracy Initiative and the Miller Center for hosting uh, this event and uh, hope we can do something like this again. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us.